Okay. I'm ready. Hope you are. My chair is just by the edge of the stage. I can't afford to move back even an inch. So if it looks I'm, I'm about to do that, put your hands in the air and shout loudly. <laughs> I, I'm fine. I'm fine. Thanks. So we're going to be talking about translators as literary activists uh, and what on earth that might mean. And translators, we want your examples. So we want to know what you think of the link between those two things. Uh, I think it, translator or literary activist is the title. So we could think about whether those two things are mutually exclusive, what the connection might be. Uh, I've, got, I've got one or two questions, which I'm just going to throw in now uh, before I introduce the panel. One is, and the title of the panel made me think this, what is an activist? If you can ask translator or literary activist, what's that mean an activist really is? And the other is a reflection more than a question, actually, uh, about impact and sensitivity. So those are two words that come to mind when I think about the theme, uh, because literary translators have to think about those two things ordinarily. So what are the impact of the words that you use? And what sensitivity do you need to understand what you're translating and the words you're deploying? And it occurred to me that's got a political parallel. So what's the impact of what you write and publish? And what sensitivities do you need to deploy the words, publish the books, etc.? And what sensitivities are you bearing in mind and or offending? So impact and sensitivity. Just floating that on the pond. And now the panel. Uh, over there at the end is Nick Kester, who's a translator and editor, and he's translated more than 30 books by Spanish and Latin American authors, uh, and was notably editor of the magazine Index on Censorship, sorry, Latin American editor, uh, and edited the English version of Argentina's report on the thousands of disappeared, called Nunca Mas, which I hope we'll hear more about, uh, and has translated and written about many human rights problems in Latin America. He's also translated books from Spain, and won prizes, including the Bahia and Clan Prize for translation. Uh, in the middle is Shirley Lee, who's a translator and author, who read classics and Persian uh, at Oxford, co-translated the poetry of 10 leading Chinese poets uh, since the Cultural Revolution uh, for the Asia Literary Review, and has more recently translated Dear Leader, uh, the memoir of North Korea's exiled poet laureate Jang Jin Sung, to be published next month. Uh, so Shirley Lee in the middle there. And Alice Guthrie here to my immediate left is now translator in residence at the Free Word Center uh, and works in so many languages there aren't, isn't time to list them. Oh, I'll have a go, I'll list some of them. Her translations from Palis no, her translations of Palestinian, Egyptian, Sudanese, Syrian, and Saudi Arabian literary works have been published by various UK and US presses. Um, and her media translations include a series of ethnographic documentary films uh, for the rebranding The Levant Project at London's Royal Holloway University. So Nick Case to Shirley Lee and Alice Guthrie. And the way we're going to do it is each of them is going to give a piece of about five minutes about their response to the title. Um, yesterday it was all looking clear when we had a sandwich just now. Uh, it's, all been, it's all been blown up a bit. So I'm looking forward to knowing what they're going to say. Because uh, I don't know right now. Um, I'll bat a few questions at them depending on time and what they've said and so on. And then you ask questions. And we've got, if, if you like, uh, yeah, we've got nearly an hour. So... Um, Shirley, you're happy to start. Opening the box. <coughs> I'm going to just get my notes up. So I'm going to take a slightly personal approach to starting it. Um, I started translating through study, my study of classics. I, so I'm, I'm a Korean, but I grew up in Hong Kong and so, um, so, so I grew up in a Korean-speaking family, had my education in an English-speaking schooling system in a Chinese-speaking world. That, that was kind of my introduction to translation. Um, and, and then came to England to study classics. And, uh, and, 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 and one of the things that kept being thrown about when people study the classics is, and I'm sure a lot of it has to do with people trying to justify funding, you know, on, 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 on some level, but a lot of it is what is the use, or not just the utilitarian use, but what, why do we read ancient literature in translation? What is the point in bringing, trans, in translating ancient literature into a modern world? Why do we do it, and what is the point? Um, and, and people spend a lot of time 
trying to not solve that question, but explore that question. And, um, and, then, and then I studied Persian, modern Persian, and, and the question became very different because Iran is seen as a topical issue, at least you know, in, in Western media and discourse. And, and so people try to find more kind of practical applications into you know, what is it help to understand the mindset of, of, a, of another culture. It, it, it suddenly has a different angle. And then I, I, I got pulled back into Korea in a very random way. I, 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 I wanted to get away from it all my life because it was very complex and um, difficult. And um, I, I got pulled back meeting this man he came to London to do the London Cultural Olympics in 2012, and he, he, he used to be the poet laureate for the dead dictator Kim Jong-il, and he's escaped. And, and the reason he says he escaped is, in, it's a really interesting story, his, his, his mentor, his poetic mentor, he, he, he remembers a time in North Korea where there was a literature outside of the system because he's that there is a Korean literature outside of North Korean history that existed before the system came into place. And then it was, then it became like an enforced amnesia and an enforced denial that any literature apart from the official one actually ever existed anywhere in history and anywhere outside the world. And, and so his parents' generation grew up on real literature as we might define it. And then as they were made to write literature for the for the state in a very explicitly political way, and they were forced to forget it. And and then in in, in my friend's generation, he, he's 40 now. He's saying, how can our nation ever produce a writer when we cannot know, or even when we know there is a literature outside of the system? Because he he grew up reading bootlegs. He he had that privilege through you know the elite have that privilege. And even when you know a literature outside of the system exists, you're not allowed to admit that it exists. You have to pretend that it doesn't exist. H how, how can you produce great, good, great writers when you are denying everything you know? And that is the job of a writer, is to deny what you know, pretend you don't know. Um, um, I don't know where I was going with that. Um, yeah, so, so, so yeah, that, 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 that funny, put, pulled me back. Um, so, so I got into this, Working with him, and the the memoir just just finished translating. It's coming out next month, and um, I'm going back to my. So so, th yeah, this was the point that with the classics, people try to answer the question, why do we do this? With something kind of more urgent and modern like Iran, people ask that question, but on a different level. And with, with North Korea, it's there is probably no more place on earth that more urgently needs, there's probably no people on earth whose voice has been more stolen from them, more oppressed, more silenced, more distorted. There's probably no more urgent place on earth right now than the North Korean people who, who need their voices translated. And yet it is probably the place in the world with which we in the outside world are more complicit in upholding that oppression. Because we look, you know, people think, oh, North Koreans are brainwashed by the propaganda. but. I actually think the outside world is brainwashed by the propaganda as much as the North Korean people are because just because they follow it and are oppressed by it does not mean they are actually like that. And, and one of the catch-22s for me was, well, who, who am I as an outsider, as someone not in the system, to say that that presentation is a facade, that it's a pretense? Who am I to say it? Sure, you know, surely they have their sovereignty to do what they want. But when you actually talk to these people, they desperately want to speak outside of it, but cannot because, you know, once you do something, like, like my friend, the exile poet laureate, his, his crime was to share his for, forbidden outside literature with a friend. And the, and the actual penalty for that was execution for him and three generations of his family, including his parents and children. That is the crime for reading foreign literature in North Korea. And yet the outside world wants to look at the official pr presentation. So. And, and I was, it came up in an earlier conversation that um, I, I, I edited a Words Without Borders, Words Without Borders issue on North Korea literature a few months ago, and never before had there ever been North Korean exiled writers in translation before because we so want to see the facade, not not the voices. Um, so have I? Not, not yet. <laughs> okay. Um, so, 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 so going back to the kind of translator or literary activist, um, it's, I, I, I don't see a dichotomy of it. Like doing Rome, you could ask that question. Doing Iran, you could ask that question. Doing North Korean literature, it's, it's one and the same because 
because activism starts with having a mind that is of your own, like if you want to you know, simplify it or generalize it. And, and the very act of writing, like, like in North Korea, there's actually a guidebook called the Juche Art Theory. And it's like a 20 volume book. And it has like the rule for everything you can and cannot do in literature. For example, you're not allowed to use the tears in literature. And for example, another thing is like, you know, my friend Jang, um, in, in North Korean love poetry, you are not allowed to write a love poem that is not unless it is between a person and the dictator. That is the only love poetry you're allowed to write in North Korea. You can't, like the idea of love poetry between, in North Korea there's no word for honey or darling or dear. You have to call your all men Tongji and all women Tongmo. It doesn't matter if it's your wife or lover or girlfriend. You still have to use the same, like there is no, like, like the, word, the word is just, the greatest accomplishment of this dictatorship was to steal every voice away from the individual and unify it into a collective language to, to destroy the individual. I mean, for, for, for example, you have like oppressions where someone colonizes a country and they want to try to erase the heritage by, you know, like in Korea, Japanese, like people had to speak Japanese and not use Korean because it was about trying to root out the old culture. But in North Korea, it's not just a matter of one culture against another. It's about one dictator system against the individual as, as we know it. it. The point was to the individual mind so that it wouldn't exist anymore. Um, oh, and, and, and the funny thing was um, what, what Jang did was he, he knew you were not allowed to love poetry, write love poetry without um, the dictator in it. It's actually in the, the Pen Atlas piece that just coming out, I think. Um, and, and what he did was he, he, he turned it round a bit because he, he was a bit, you know, rebellious. And, but but he, he didn't even realize it would be an anti-political thing. He just thought it was an aesthetic problem that they could resolve within, you know, because he was in the system and he didn't know otherwise. And, and there's a poem where he wrote, um, th there's a soldier and the soldier, and of course you can't express the soldier's love for his girlfriend, that's illegal. So what, what, what the soldier says in the poem is, I'd love to walk in time, he's walking like really fast ahead of the, his girlfriend, and the soldier says, I'd really love to walk in time with you, but I can't right now because I need to defend the country and serve the leader who I love. But when I finish defending my leader, I may start walking in time with you. And that was, that actually caused like a revolution inside North Korea, and the dictator actually endorsed it. Um, so, so, so you, you could call that a rebellion, but, and, and you could see instances of humanity like that, but, but, but what Jang said, and I, I don't think I've got a right to disagree with, with every single North Korea I met says this, there does not exist a literature in North Korea, and there cannot exist a literature in North Korea, unless, within the, unless you are living outside of its enforced system and its enforced vacuum. So, so yeah, literary activist, it's, it's not about activism, it's not about politics, it's just about, you know what, these people have a voice and need a platform and if I can translate some of it, it's, you know, wh whatever it's called, it's, it's that, so. Okay, well that, that's raised lots of questions for me and you two, I imagine, which I'll come to later. Thanks, mm -hmm. Shirley. Uh, Nick Kaster, I hope you're going to talk about Latin American dictatorships yeah. and possibly some parallels there, uh, similar but different scenarios. Yes, I think when we were talking earlier, I realized that I'm perhaps going to argue the opposite, that uh, I'd like to be less of a literary activist. Um, I, I, I first realized just the, the connections between literature and politics when I was in Argentina in the 1970s. At one point, um, I was on a train in the north of Argentina and I was reading a book called Las Venas Abiertas de América Latina the open veins of Latin America. And uh, six uh, people from the army got on board the train. Um, unfortunately, I'd covered the book in, in, in plain brown cover, and I don't think any of them could read. So I said, oh, it's just a, it's an English novel, because I'm obviously English. And they believed me and didn't haul me off the train, though they did haul a couple of other people off. And in that same year, the... Uh, the family I was staying with, we had a book burning. We had to put all, they had a collection. Argentina was very famous for its, its beautifully produced books. We had a collection of all the 19th century Russian authors, Chekhov, Turgenev, everyone. But because of the political situation, we had a book burning. We burnt all these wonderful Aguilar uh, volumes on, on uh, nothing to do with politics as such, but because they were Russian and because everybody was, was looking for 
reasons to, to disappear you then. We, we had a, a, a sort of a, a book burning and a party as we burnt them. Um, so I, 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 when I got back to England, I immediately became involved with human rights, with Amnesty International. And that was when a lot of exiles were coming across to here. So my introduction to literature was the exiles who'd left those countries and were producing work and wanted to find expression for it abroad. The unofficial, um, the people who couldn't live there, but mostly for political rather than literary reasons. And, uh, and as uh, Ollie said, that led on to me having to produce, not having to, but producing the English version of the report on the disappeared in Argentina in 1985, um, which Harold Pinter made his book of the year in 1985, which is a bit odd. Um, so there was this mixture of human rights with literature, um, with the political struggle that was going on there, and working then for index on censorship, and, and yes, giving people who were no longer living in their countries, giving them a voice, allowing them to to get their points of view, to get their, their ideas out of the, of the country. And at that time in the 1980s, there was of course a much more uh, a receptive attitude, it seems to me, in, in, in Britain for that kind of literature. People w w still believed in, in that and were looking for that kind of thing. Um, but I think that's changed since. Uh, another personal example, I was, um, in, in the end of the 1980s, the Sandinista revolution in Nicaragua, the vice president, a man called Sergio Ramirez, is a novelist. He used to get up at four in the morning, do his three hours of, of novel writing, and then, then be the vice president. At, at the time, it was when the Contra War was going on in, uh, in Nicaragua. And he produced, he, he's a prolific novel writer. He did a 450-page novel. Nothing to do with the, um, the, the current situation as then was in Nicaragua, but back in the 1930s. And they're very s portraying Nicaraguan society then and perhaps looking for the reasons why uh, the dictatorship of the Somosas had happened. But that book, because he was the vice president of a revolutionary regime in Nicaragua, was taken up by a, a large American publisher. I translated it, it took me a long time because it was 450 pages and, and so on. The, the Sandinistas lost the elections in 1989 and were replaced by a right-wing government, Violeta Chamorro. And a week after, the Americans canceled the contract. They didn't want to know him, an ex-vice president of, of an ex-revolutionary regime was it wasn't news wasn't wasn't what drives a lot of publishing this I'm coming back to what I was saying at the beginning I think that what's happened maybe since the mid 1990s is that people it's a bit what uh, you were saying have got one image of Latin America which is that of the struggle it's an image of violence it's an image of of, of repression and I, I'm, I'm quite astounded that they are still still seem to be looking at, at that kind of book as what represents a continent. This is what I think goes wrong very often. You get um, stuck in an image. So recent prize-winning books from Latin America have been a novel about the 1980s violence in Peru, violence in Colombia, violence in Chile. Um, and it, w when I said at the beginning of that, I sort of, um, I'm an anti-activist in that sense. I don't want it to be that. I want it to be, as you, again, as you're saying, it wanted to reflect much more different voices. And I think that we, we in, in, the, in the West here in, in Britain and the United States, we tend to put all foreign countries into one category. And we talk about human rights, but we forget that that was part of a political struggle. So it, it's, it becomes kind of, becomes black and white in that sense, and it, it, that's not a true reflection of what's going on, I think. So um, I'm a de-activist, if you like. I like literature that, that is, a, is away from that, is offering something different, because I think that that's the way that literature works. It doesn't take on uh, violence directly. It doesn't have to be about human rights. Um, 
So in a, in a way, I've become a non-activist. <laughs> Thank Sorry. you, Nick. Sorry. <laughs> That's okay. Uh, Alice, I know you've got a few things to say about how we categorize the countries that we're reading about. Hi, yeah. But actually, I just wanted to respond to your final okay. point there as part of it, because it resonates a lot with what I'd been thinking of as actually being the de a, a possible definition for a sort of translation activism, which is exactly what you describe as being a non-activist, as it were, in that, um, you know, I think um, part of a, a crucial part of our role as translators is to bring across a diversity of voices and allow there to be um, narratives that aren't about violence and, and, and so on. So it's interesting that you can think one can label that in different ways. But um, yeah, perhaps we'll come back to that as well. Um, I was really going to start, or I suppose I started thinking about the questions for this panel with um, quite a sense of impotence and, you know, what, wondering, well, what is activism anyway? I, I, I guess I feel that it's quite a cheapened word these days or it's, it's slapped around quite a lot. I mean, as in it's, the label is slapped around, put on things. Um, you know, there's a body shop perfume, isn't there, called Activist? So, um, and, and, and sometimes I feel, well, you know, just being a morally alive person and making discerning choices is uh, perhaps a kind of activism. And so maybe, maybe the choices I make about the translation that I do and the way I do it is no more of an activist um, mentality or consciousness than is my attempt to limit my use of plastic or whatever it might be. Um, so, but actually it's been interesting because in the last few days I've had quite a lot of conversations here about some of these questions. And then I've, as I was saying to Oli before, my perspective started to shift a little bit and I thought, oh yeah, you know, maybe we are activists. I don't know, I suppose it's a question of, it's partly a question of humility about the um, impact or not of our, of our tiny literary work in, the, in these struggles. And it's, um, and it's partly a question of sort of pessimism and, 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 and impotence. I mean, you know, I've, I studied in Syria and I work a lot on Syrian literature, so it's very difficult and to, to feel that, you know, one's doing anything useful at all a lot of the time. But um, it was incredible just hearing from you about North Korea, actually, and I was moved by those descriptions. And, and I was thinking of the kind of dark... When I was in, in Syria as a student, there was this kind of dark humour that they would say, you know hey, it's not as bad as North Korea. And we, we hope not to have to say that about our regimes, right? Well, North Korea or Burma would be mentioned. Hey, it's not as bad as there. So, um, yeah, how, how do we work with, these, um, with trying to create spaces for these voices? I suppose the thing that I feel, and again, linking to, to what you were really saying at the end, is that there's a kind of, there tends to be, there's a Western media tendency about... Um, the voices from the areas that we work with have it, it, it's prescribed, isn't it? What they're what they're meant to be talking about and what kind of voices they're meant to be. So, I work mainly from Arabic, and the 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 voices, you know, the women's voices are supposed to be all about veiling and unveiling. Um, you know, the book covers have to have those images, and you know, and at the moment with Syria, it has to be about the the, the struggle. Well, of course, there's loads being said about the struggle, but it's not all being said in a direct in the way that we would identify as such. So I suppose part of what I would identify as activism in my work is to allow a diversity, a plurality of su more subtle voices and maybe, you know, quirky voices that are talking about aspects of the uprising and its consequences that might not be immediately obvious or, or indeed just universal uh, aspects of life. Um, and I think one of the things that is, uh, is, is depressing is that, you know, we work hard on this stuff and then sometimes it feels like it kind of disappears without trace um, because, you know, tiny print runs and usually not much of a budget for promotion. And, and, and But then again, I think, well, we work on translating this stuff, we make it exist, and then once it's out there, I suppose it's not really down to me how it gets, how much it gets accessed, you know, that, 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 that part of what we're trying to do is make there be a library available, and then, and then does it get accessed? You know, do people want to search out um, the very few North Korean uh, voices that have managed to get across? Well, 
possibly that's not your responsibility, right? And so, you know, I, I, um, I would urge you to look, I would urge everyone to, to look for these niche, incredible um, pieces of writing. Um, but then increasingly, you know, the translator's role is about trying to make that happen, make that access happen. And sometimes some of the outreach work that we do around these projects, so, um, you know, workshops that happen and so on. Um, I suppose what I'm trying to say is that, you, yes, I think it's really important that we do consciousness raising work. Um, but I also sometimes am... Um, overwhelmed by the scale, the, the tiny scale or, or, or the enormity of the task. Am I out of time? Not yet. Oh, okay. Let's see what else I put on my <laughs> paper. Um, oh, yeah, I was going to talk a bit about, um, well, yeah, two other things, really. I, I, I think that one of the ways that I would define um, sort of translation activism is not just in what you do do but what you don't so what you turn down because given that it's such a precarious um, way to make a living um, you know I have repeatedly turned down um, possibilities of working with GCHQ for example <laughs> since I graduated and I'm really proud of that you know and I've always been skint so I, I think that's quite important to mention you know I think that is a kind of um, linguistic activism or something um, you know, and I, and, and I know that everyone working with these kind of um, language security languages um, has also done that. So I think it's, yeah, it's not just about what we do do. And um, the other thing was about, yeah, the sort of the horrible vicissitudes of the, the whole fashion thing. Yeah. And so, yeah, you know, Syrian writing is quite in demand now. And... Um, I've had quite a few meetings at the book fair about it, and you know it wasn't, and I guess it won't be again. And so that I think that's that's painful. I think that's it's it's difficult. And it, you know, when I went to study in Damascus in 2001, most people didn't know where it was, and and now they do. And um, I think it's it's difficult, isn't it, when things are a kind of a product in that way? And how do we stay true to our our, our deeper reasons for being involved in those places and um, our loyalty and our love for those those voices. Um, yeah, I think they're my main points for now. Okay, thank you. I, uh, one question comes up straight away, which is what do you, well, how do you respond when Syria is suddenly in fashion and everybody's asking you about it and you think they might well not be in one or three years' time? Uh, I think you just have to be really discerning and really calm and, and really accepting of that the, this is the system, this is the media um, system that we live in and the short attention span and, and all of that that we know so well. And it's no one, it's no one of us in particular's fault. And, um, and you have to be really careful about what, you know, not, not yeah, who you work with and, and in, in what way. But I suppose you have to just accept, well, I feel that I have to just accept that that's, that, okay, this is the chance now, this is the moment, that's still only in quite a small way. I can say, yeah, I do, I know three more Syrian writers, you know, you want to feature them? Mm. Um, do you, and do you choose them on literary merit or political, or how, how do you make the choice? Um, well, I think for me it's, I couldn't really categorize it in either of those two ways, what makes me like a piece of writing. I, I, I hope it's a sort of subtle weave of, of, of those two things and, every, and everything else. I'm not sure. Because that, that was a problem with a lot of Latin American literature I was looking at in the 80s. The, the, the political was always on, you know, um, washed out everything else, really. Mm. And uh, although you might support them politically, you didn't want to translate it because th that wasn't the message you wanted to get across, really. It's mm. difficult. Mm. So it sounds like both of you are pro-literary quality, whatever else is going on. Yeah, I think so. And, and of course, the, 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 yes. big, <laughs> the big problem we're, we're, we're sort of skating around is that at the book fair, for example, two of the Spanish publishers have said, oh, we've got a great book on Syria. But it can't be that instant, can it? It can't be you, you produce literature within two years or three years of whatever. It has to, you know, the longer the better, really. Um, so for you, it needs to be literature, as it were, with a capital L, which sounds like it might not be what they're offering or hoping you'll translate. Yeah, no, I think, I think so. I think so. And, uh, and you raised... Because, because uh, uh, as you were saying, I think that in a way you're, 
you're, you're destining it for a library and it should be able to last, I think, beyond the, the kind of ephemeral or, or the, the newsworthy. You have to try and find those qualities, yeah. I think. You, you, you raised the point of fashions originally with a particularly salient example from late 80s, early 90s. Uh, and in, the, in your regions of concern, Spain and Latin America, what are the fashions or, or lack of them now and how's that affecting... Well, I, th I think as I was suggesting, people are still bringing out, think that they associate Latin America with violence and they, that that's what they're interested in. That time and time again, that's what we get, those stories that disappeared in Argentina, the Sendero Lum Luminoso in Peru. And, and, lo and lots of contemporary novels coming out about that, Yeah, right? Yeah, but so again, I think, so you I, think you, back. Yeah, I think you have to... But as a translator, um, I turn one or two down because I don't think... I, I think there is a, 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 a greater diversity than is being picked up here. And, I mean, this isn't the place to complain about publishers, but they... Uh, they are quite obvious in their choices very often. It, and maybe this is where we're activists. We're trying to persuade them to look a little more widely mm -hmm. to say that it doesn't have to be the latest book on, uh, on the disappeared in Argentina. You know, lots of other things are going on there. Shirley, do you feel that's part of your role as a translator? I was actually going to say, like, it's, it's, it's funny the way we've all said it really differently with different backgrounds, but... I, 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 no, again, I don't want to generalise, but I really feel we, we're coming to that same kind of definition. I mean, I think there are translators, literary translators, who work for their target or in their target world in terms of how they choose or work. And then, um, and then there are translators who are kind of have their foot more in the language and world they're tra translating out of. And and I've and I and I'm maybe that's a personal division I'm seeing, but I, I I've always sympathised more with at least in the work I do and I choose to do is I, I sympathize with the work I'm translating out of and I want that world to go because m maybe also because I've grown up in this you know two world thing and I, I get quite you know what you said it's so overwhelming sometimes again it's not the right place you know sometimes overwhelming just how like kind of distorted or incorrect or not not accurate and it just does not reflect what you see in English media or English publishing. It does not reflect the country they're supposed to be talking about. In you know, it's either it may be stereotyped or it may be made into some cause which actually does not exist in the way it is said to exist. And 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 I, and I always and and whatever you call it, non-activism, activism. I I've, maybe it's something more about you're trying to. You know, you you see a need. You see a you see something that can be improved in in terms of the, the bridging and. Do you, do you feel it's possible to be effective as a translator doing that? Um, I mean, I, I'll being, being that bridge. I mean, in terms of a very, in my very limited North Korea example, just because it's, in one way, because it's so absolute, it makes it so difficult. In another way, maybe it makes it easier for me, in, you know, to kind of digest that in in a country where the act of writing itself is treason, just to get your voice out is political and no matter how apolitical you want to make it, it's classified as political. And I'm fascinated by your example of the Words Without Borders issue that you mentioned, which uh, brought the first non-state literature into English. Mm. Is that right? So, oh, two questions. Uh, the first is, why hadn't that happened before and what made it possible? And the second is, what was working on that issue like? What did you have to do? What was your involvement? Um, I can be really polemical about this, or very open. Um, I, I, I think there's two two broad ways in which to. Sorry. She's there. She's there. Uh -huh. Oh. Be careful. That's words without borders. Oh no, there. it's not. It's not that kind of polemical. It's more like putting. Presumably, you're on the same side as the editor of the magazine. <laughs> yeah. No. No. I was. I was. I was. I, um, I was going to say in terms of why these exiles had not had a chance to. Yeah. Yeah. yeah right. Yeah. At all. Um, yeah. like, broad. Two broad reasons. One was the political not just the climate, but the restrictions, because there was such a policy of, I don't want to call it appeasement, again, that's really polemical, but there were, there, they always had a lot, a lot of legal restrictions on them. They were not allowed to testify, not allowed to write, if you were a North Korean refugee, because it would upset the North Korean regime, and it may, might provoke them, which actually, it's a card they like to use. Um, you know, because they, they, cause the, the what, what, what the North Korean regime does is the only voice, the only North Korean voice that can exist is the state voice. So every refugee and every exile that speaks outside of the system is a direct attack on what 
sustains the system. So that is kind of the logic of why other governments tend to repress North Korean refugee voices because they don't want to upset North Korea. So it's, it's like a vicious cycle that's continued and it's literally in the last few years that those gag orders have started to lift. Um, so there's some collaboration, they're not helped by foreign yeah, regimes in yeah, this. Yeah. Mm. Okay. And uh, Alice, you were talking about uh, maybe a translator's role is just to do, translate a book, if it goes into a library, lots of people read it, so much the better. If it doesn't, well, you've done your job um, <coughs> to slightly, slightly uh, caricature your position on that. Uh, does either of you, Nick or Shirley, disagree? No, I think I was saying the same thing, that I think it's, it's, it's that, that is what you should perhaps limit yourself to, as you say, against what's actually happening there. You, you, you get overwhelmed by it. Um, and uh, um, I, think, I think that probably is the best thing you can do. You can, you can make the effort to bring that world here and hope that, that some people will pick up on it. I don't know what more you think, Alice. Yeah, I think, I think that's yeah. what I was saying. Yeah. I, I, think, I think we're sort of saying the same thing, aren't we, all three of us? Um, I, I worked for the BBC World Service for 15 years, and... Um, uh, and now, having insomnia, I'm back to listening to it at three or four in the morning. And it struck me when I was working there and again now, again and again we're going on about these foreign countries where usually darker-skinned people are being horrible to each other. And this, this seems to be what we want to digest, isn't it? It's, uh, it's, it's all put in those terms, but it's, there's so much more, as we all know from different countries that we translate from, there's so much more to it than that which should be reflected what gets said and read here. Alice, are there any things that particularly occur to you that we're missing on stories from Syria, for instance? Um, yeah, I guess we're missing, you know, I guess we're missing most of it in a way. Um, yeah, I, I find it very hard to talk about. Uh, there, there, I mean, at the moment, I'm feeling like there's some amazing films. I, I want to give a plug to Return to Homs, which is just an absolutely mind-blowing documentary that I watched last week in, in London, and it's going to be on wider release. Um, Return to Homs, really very, very, very important Syrian-made documentary about how um, ordinary people t turn into freedom fighters under the pressure of, um, of the things that have been going on. Well, that's how. That's what I saw it to be about. But um, yeah, I, I do find I do I do feel overwhelmed by um, how we can how we can hear um, very much, really, given the situation. Yeah, yeah. And you're you're rebranding the Levant project. Can you say a bit about that? Oh um, well, that's that's quite old now, but that that's very interesting. Yeah, that's academic, uh, uh, radical ethnographic filmmaking by, by, by a geographer. Um, but, uh, and it's, yeah, it's available online. They're interesting ethnographic films about um, Damascus and Jordan. But there's a, there's a if, we, if we're talking about specific projects, I could mention the Syria Speaks anthology that's, yes, that's coming in June. So that's a, um, a, a good example of some really uh, uh, very broadly varied and uh, interesting, nuanced work. It's... Um, Prose, I think, also poetry, reportage, um, fiction, long and short, longer and shorter, short fiction, and lots of visual art and uh, some academic essays. So, amazing range of work in one book called Syria Speaks: um, Voices from the Frontline, and it's coming out with um, Saki Telegram in June. And there's going to be a load of events around that as well. And I think that those kind of books are quite. Um, so I'm one of the translators on that, but I think that those books are important because they are creating a space for a, yeah, a, a, mm -hmm. a wider kind of range of voices. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you. So we have got time for your questions, comments, if there are any so far. I've got one or two more. We could hear about uh, Alice's translator residency, perhaps, more she's doing there. Yeah? Um, I was just wondering because um, I find often with translations and like for example, from a Palestinian or Syrian perspective, it's more that voices are being curated rather than translated. And I find that really difficult because there's that whole thing of 
um, you're bringing out a particular story that's interesting to the country, such as the UK. So, for example, I've read a book of short, uh, short stories by young Gazan authors in, in English, and I was so disappointed by it because it was exactly, all of it was really explicitly violent and political, and I just thought, I know there's more imagination in Gaza, but it's not coming out because it's not, not what's interesting. So how can you actually do anything about that because it comes to, down to funding in the end? I think that's a really, well, shall I answer? I think that's a really um, important point and because the, the whole, we haven't touched so much really on the, the whole issue of kind of the gatekeepers, as we say, yeah, and how things get through and what the filters are. And the, but, you know, that in a wider way, that is what we're talking about, our, our struggle. I mean, yes, it's curated. It's always going to be curated. And um, if there were, you know, more and more, if, if there's more and more translation happening, then I, I guess it'll be le it's less of an intense, you know, narrow sample. And, um, and I know the book that you're talking about. And actually there is a, 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 another Gazan short fiction selection coming out um, from Comma Press this year, The Book of Gaza. And I think that's, um, that you should you know, give uh, UK gatekeeping of Gazan writing another chance with, with that volume. Um, but yeah, we, and there's a few things online. There's a few Gazan selections, including um, Literature Across Frontiers did one. But y y you know, you need to, uh, yeah, we need to keep struggling about that. I don't have anything very positive to say, I'm afraid. I just want to add uh, on, your, on, your, on your word about gatekeepers. Um, mm. I, I, I get very uh, emotional about that, that concept quite a lot because, um, you know, you, it, not just in a simple way of like, oh, the, no, I mean, I mean, especially in, 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 a, in a country which is so easy to stereotype or region, you know, like Latin America, Middle East, that there's all these stereotypes about it. And it's not, it's not just those abstract things. There are people as well who, who have maybe built certain careers in certain ways. And it's, you know, you do not want to fight. You just want to get literature out. But you kind of get forced into fighting with gatekeepers. You know, not fighting, but, you know, you, it, it, you're always undermining it's, it's always disruptive, kind of by definition, in a way, translation because, literary translation, because you're disrupting your, that, that country's view of another country, in a way, because it's, it's never going to be a perfect reflection. It'd be perfect to hear from a gatekeeper after that. <laughs> Any gatekeepers at that? No. Anyway, one question just to your left there. Um, yes, I wanted to pick up on the question of the responsibility of the literary activist to the writer. So you publish um, a North Korean writer who may be in exile, but actually what might be the repercussions back home to their family? I mean, does that also completely censor, stifle free expression? Because, you know, it's people's lives. <laughs> Perhaps the writer's taken that step already, if you see what I mean. But family's in a, back home. No, but in agreeing, if you see what I mean. Yeah, um, just just the way I do it is, like, may maybe because this is, I, I just, I, I do it, it's, it's, I, I do what the writer says, I, I trust the writer completely, and I, f I, I just feel like, you know what, it's, it's, it's not my family, it's not my country, it's, it's their families and their country that they're putting online just by writing a poem, and I, I, I have no right to intervene, but I have every responsibility to do what they want, you know. Um. One all the way over the other side. Um, yes, I have a question on the authenticity of the voices that we hear. Um, and for example, um, I am deeply disturbed by um, writers writing in English um, who um, presumably do a lot of uh, research on their topics. Um, an example um, would, uh, that I know is uh, The Cellist of Sarajevo, which was written in English by a Canadian um, and takes um, the Bosnian conflict um, and fictionalizes it. And um, I'm wondering, um, is this sort of thing um, I guess morally acceptable because this person, I mean, it was well researched and everything and it was a beautiful book, but it was not uh, a true, authentic, in quotes, um, Bosnian account. 
So um, I just want to know your thoughts on, on and such things. And, and you disagree? You disagree with that idea? You? Uh, well, I, I I don't think it's authentic. I mean, I I would prefer to read um, a Bosnia account in translation than read mm. a fictionalized account um, by a Canadian, uh, mm. frankly. Mm. Authenticity? Anyone? Can I can I actually yeah, say something about that? I it's I, I, it's funny that. Um, kind of what I aim to do is, you know, to be this trans transparent channel. Transparent is, you know, a very negotiable word to, you know, because you're always making compromises in any translation. Um, and and so I'm not North Korean, and but people see me sometimes as the gatekeeper to North Korean voices. And it's like, I, 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 I you know, like, and I, I don't claim to speak for anyone. I just want to let people speak. And how do you man, you know, and so, yeah, I, I get really uncomfortable talking about North Korea at all. It's like I always feel it should be the North Korean speaking, not me, even though, and, and the kind of only kind of um, consolation I have is, well, okay, I'm, at least I'm trying to listen and I hope I've done, you know, the best I can in that. So, I, yeah, that's my take on authenticity is, you know, even being, you know, in that position is, you know, it's, it's some, yeah, like maybe it's a personal thing for everyone and it's about how far you're willing to, give voice versus take voice versus hijack voice, you know, wh whatever the continuum is. I, I think you ha you, there has to be room for both. You can't censor people and say, don't write about what you think about what's going on out there. But it is very different. Um, I just There's going to be a, a, an anthology on the Spanish Civil War for the 80 years, or I think it's 80, is it? Yeah, in, 19, in 2016. And it's very noticeable how different the non-Spanish writers write about it from the Spaniards. Uh, and I personally prefer the, the authenticity, as you say, of, of the Spaniards, and just how much is missing from Hemingway or whoever, or Orwell, whoever went there. But it, there has to be room for both. Um, um, people want to go out and see what's happening, you know, and, 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 and can turn it into literature. In, in those examples, is there anything we get from uh, Orwell or Laurie Lee or whatever that we don't get from the Spaniards? Um, well, I, yeah, it is reflecting it back into your world. It's this whole question of the two different worlds and how they interact and how the different perspective, you're, the way you've been brought up and the language you've been brought up in, what that gives you and what that lends to your literature. Mm. Um, I think we're all saying we perhaps prefer the the one from out there rather than one produced from here, but there must be room for both, I think. Yeah, um, uh, the, the two things that I wanted to say about that, I think one one rule of thumb that I um, try to have is um, that I'm not, uh, in terms of the authenticity of a voice, I'm translating a voice. So if I'm translating um, a Syrian woman, I'm translating her. I'm not translating the voice of Syrian women. And, and it's amazing how many actually well-educated people will say to me, what do Arab women think about such and such, right? So that still goes on a lot. So, so it's to keep reminding people that like, yeah, this is one 30-year-old from Halep and it's not the Syrian woman. So that's, that's one way around it. And then just quickly on the sort of Louis de Bernier phenomenon that you mentioned as I think of it. I think it's, um, you, you know, yeah, I would, I would agree with Nick that I, I guess there has to be room and we just choose what we want to read. Um, but I think it's a, interesting because it's such a um, British or Anglophone phenomenon, isn't it? Because it, and it goes hand in hand with us having, um, doing so little translation. I mean, us, I mean the, the, the industry, our culture. So that we have got a tradition which, as I understand it, maybe, correct me if, if I'm wrong, but as I understand it, doesn't really exist in other languages. We have this, um, trans, uh, this, this tradition of this kind of mediated story so that you have your, you know, and I, I do think it's quite a colonial, old school approach and I'm also a bit uncomfortable with it, but I think, it, yeah, it goes hand in hand. So I think we are, by, by continuing to translate stuff, you know, that's another way that we're activists, maybe. We're trying to get around that, yeah, and get sort of a little bit more direct to the, to the voice from that place. Uh, we've got one at the very back first, and then three or four more if there's time. We've probably got time for three. Can I ask, uh, just very quickly, can I ask Alice, you mentioned, I think, a book, Syria Speaks, and I wonder, um, do you know the um, editorial background to that, who's editing it, and also whether it's just taking very contemporary writing or 
or wider than writing as well, or whether it's also including work by poets, prose writers who were maybe writing 20, 30, 40 years ago as well? It's, it's, very contem it's all very contemporary, and the editorial background is um, a team of three people, actually, two Syrians and one um, who is uh, not, not Syrian but has been there, working there a, lot, a long time. So does that answer it? Was the, what was the other bit? Uh, Sorry, Stephen. I think it, it was sort of partly also a question in response to your earlier comment of, um, you know, that difficulty of, um, of uh, knowing what to translate and what not to translate, and the, mm. the contemporary, the, contempor the, the fact that a lot of southern Syrian literature and other material is being asked for, as against mm. the fact that there have been some wonderful writers living in Syria for many, many years, yeah. who, whose work maybe isn't rising to the surface so easily yeah. in, in English translation. Yeah, thanks, Stephen. You've reminded me of something that I wanted to say, actually. So there's two things about that. One thing that I wanted to flag up earlier is that, um, uh, yes, there's this demand for it, which we might feel uncomfortable uh, about, but there, there's also um, been an upsurge of Syrian writing. Like, the, the, the situation has um, lots of people have... Uh, as well as lots of people being killed, lots of people have grown up a lot during the conflict and, and been galvanized and so on. So, you know, it's very interesting, some writers, to look at their, their pre and post, up, uh, pre and during, I should say, uprising work, you know, that how it's changed them, how it's developed them. And also, lots of people obviously have gone into exile and so feel free to say things that they didn't before or indeed, to re you know, they didn't want to write in a limited way and so now they are writing for the first time. So it's not just that there's a sort of... Um, horrible, cynical market that's looking for, you know, there's also a reason on the other side. Um, so that's one thing. I've forgotten the other thing I was going to say. What was the, what was the question? Uh, I can't remember what. Oh, thank you. Yeah, yeah. So the other thing about it going back in time, about whether work has to be contemporary, is that, um, yeah, I, I absolutely agree with what I think you're saying, that, it, we, that we mustn't just focus on the you know, youth and what's happening, what's being written now. And so something that I'm starting to do now is look at, um, you know, okay, let's try and use this wave of interest to pick up some, some of the older voices. So it um, looks like there's going to be a collection coming out of a writer who's now in his 80s, who was very successful in the 70s and who's now in exile. So, yeah, yeah. I just want to squeeze in a few more questions we had down here, closer to the front, actually. Well, while we're waiting, I think, I think we're all saying it is. It's these quieter voices, isn't it, that tend to be overlooked in, in what is fashion or what is the, the news of the moment. And uh, perhaps we're activists in that way, that you look out the people who, who haven't been associated with that trend but have studied their own societies and have got things to say about it. Yeah. And maybe we have to find, as translators, get to them rather than the people who are kind of the headlines. I think that, that is definitely a, a way that we're activists. Yeah, it's like passing the microphone to the right people. In yeah. A, in a yeah. we, we've got time probably for, for two more fairly quick ones. Yeah. Um, I was wondering, where is, uh, is there anything to be done about us literary activists or slash freelance publicists, independent um, promoters who work with translators and try to bring a, a, a raise atten a awareness about books and then institutions that are based in London, for example, start threatening you literally and tell you that they're going to harm you in any way they can be of all of the work you do because you voice things that they're doing that seem to, to, to you and to other people to be wrong. Is there any platform that we can go to and actually address these Institutions issues? in London, did yes. you say? Uh, cultural institutions that represent countries here in London under mm. you know, European Union laws and all that. It happened to me, and I really am worried, not only personally saddened and frustrated by it, but I'm very worried about these um, phenomena. And I wonder, is there any place that I can go to and voice my concerns? Uh. Knowing very well that what I do is strictly and perfectly, you know, all right. Yeah. Yeah. It's like the long arm of the cultural regime from overseas, isn't it? Being present here and putting pressure on... Well, I, I know a few examples. No, you. Well, well, I mean, there are there are organisations for um, for protecting writers. I don't know if you've tried them or if you. I haven't yet. Okay. I'm, I'm okay. still in that state okay. of amazement. Mm. Okay. Well, it slightly depends. I'm, I'm not. 
I, I don't have compendious knowledge of this kind of thing, so I'm just going to give you a few suggestions. It slightly Thank depends you. on the type of work that you're doing. Um, so there are journalist unions. So the yeah, NU I'm a journalist too. So. Okay, so the NUJ, uh, National Union of Journalists. Um, uh, yeah, uh, Society of Authors, I guess. That's true, the Society yeah. of Authors. And then there are a few organisations based at the Free Word Centre in Farringdon, right. so there's English Pen. Uh, you would know more than me about Index on Censorship. Yeah. Um, Article 19 is also based at the Free Word Centre. Any yeah. others? No, yeah. that's but, but you're saying specifically to try and promote things. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right. Any Thank answers? You. Well, well Pen runs you. a thing called the Pen Atlas, which I'll are... Check that which are translated articles from, from all over the world, but particularly with reference to um, uh, repression of writers. So, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, um, I, I, I'm sure I'll think of more. Yeah. Okay, yeah. I'll stay in touch. <laughs> Thank you. I don't know anything about the Press Complaints Com Commission, but if anyone else does, it's said not to be, it's said not to be very independent. But Okay, uh, one more question. Blue jumper uh, there, and glasses. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, quite unfairly taking the last question. But I just wanted to build on the um, point about authenticity earlier. And I wondered whether we could connect it to this uh, compartmentalizing of fiction in other countries. Maybe it's, and it's just an open suggestion, but maybe you'd like to respond to it. Maybe it's a desire for perceived authenticity that makes that makes us want to read, for example, the voice of women in Syria, somebody who's who can speak for the whole of Syria, a woman who could speak for all women in Syria, rather than some you know other things which might be being written in these countries which aren't about, say, violence or an issue that we're particularly concerned about. And perhaps we might even be more scornful of, for example, popular fiction which doesn't deal with these themes being written in those countries, but that we read things that are written here and very happy with them and we don't sort of see them as being as needing to represent in an authentic way that kind of that kind of kind of real experience that everyone has a kind of desire to to understand do you think that might be the link there i think for me the key is that you know any any voice is authentic right that you know that if I, if, you know, if you, if I say something and you want to hear me, that's my voice, isn't it? Whatever I say, or if you say, you know, they're, they're all, so when we, it's, I think for me, it's dangerous when we start trying to say, uh, what, uh, you know, her voice is not authentic because she's not speaking about the struggle or she is speaking about the struggle or, um, I don't know if that fully answers. But, but it's what you were saying before, d distinguishing between the individual voice and representing exactly. the whole of a country, somebody in the, Book Fair said to me yesterday, uh, one of the larger publishers, I've got my Syrian author. And so she's got the authentic voice from Syria now. She doesn't want to know any others. She's got it. She's got the one, and then she'll get one from Mexico, and then she'll get one. That, that's the way it works, isn't it? Publishers talk a lot about my author. My yeah. author this, my author did that, and now they're yeah. talking about my Syrian as well. Yeah. So, uh, On that note, that's all we've got time <laughs> for, I'm afraid. So please join me in thanking Nick Case to Shirley Lee and Alice Guthrie. Thanks for your questions as well.